All right, we left off. Um, we got a few verses left in chapter 12 of Matthew. Uh, then we'll look at a number of parables in chapter 13. We'll only look at the main, the first parable this morning. Um, as we saw last time, the religious leaders are starting to get really mad at Jesus. He has been doing what none of them could do. That was, he was encouraging the people, he was blessing the people, he was healing the people of both uh, physical ailments and spiritually. And as a result, the religious leaders are plotting against Jesus. Um, we saw that they are looking for an opportunity to destroy him. And, and it's all because they fear losing their grip on control, their grip on power over the people. And one of the main reasons they are so upset is because he's doing a lot of his miracles on the Sabbath day, and that really drove them up a wall. But again, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, and so he makes the rules, not the religious leaders. And so then they start accusing him of doing things in the power of Satan. But he quickly shoots down all those ridiculous arguments and accusations. Um, in the meantime, his earthly family, they're getting worried about Jesus, uh, I'm sure they heard the rumblings, you know, about the religious leaders wanting to kill Jesus. I'm sure they heard the rumblings from the people who are saying, is this the son of David? Could this be the son of God, the Messiah? And the leaders are wanting to kill him, his mother Mary and his half-brothers. They now come to him and they try to intervene on his behalf. So we pick up in chapter 12, verse 46. So while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Now it's in Mark's gospel in chapter 3, around verse 21, where it says that they thought he was out of his mind. Look at this verse in John 7, verse 5. It says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. And so in their minds, they are doing uh, an intervention uh, with Jesus. They think they're going to rescue him. They're going to talk him off the ledge. You know, people are starting to think he's the Messiah. Now, at the same time, there must have been a thousand and one things going through Mary's mind. After all, she was the virgin. She had the angel Gabriel show up and tell her, you're going to conceive. The Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. You're going to be pregnant with the Messiah, the angel would come to Joseph and tell him, I know you guys are engaged, but you're going to take her to be your wife. She's not pregnant by some other person. This is a thing of God. And so you'll name him Jesus, like it says there, his name is Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. But here, we're about 30 years later, uh, the Messiah's ministry is in full swing. Joseph is probably gone home to be with the Lord at this point. Nothing more is said about him. Mary's other sons are thinking Jesus has gone off the deep end. And so here we see the family shows up wanting to speak with Jesus. Now, at the end of this chapter, in verse 55, it'll talk about Jesus' other brothers. They're half-brothers because after Jesus was born, then Joseph and Mary had at least six children together, names the four sons, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and sisters. These would be half-sisters. So at least six people were born to Joseph and Mary after Jesus was born. Here's something else I find amusing. It doesn't matter how old you are, your mother will always worry about you. <laughs> and it's funny because Mary's worried about Jesus. Really? I mean, he's perfect. Never sinned, never did anything wrong. And so don't get down on your mom if she's still alive and she worries about you because you're far from perfect. You're not even close to being perfect. And so she's got good reason to worry about you, I'm sure. My mom worried about me, you know, even when I was in my 50s. And so it's Jesus. She's worried about him. So here's Jesus. He's talking to the multitudes. He's probably giving a Bible study in this home, as we'll see he'll come out of this house in a moment. And his mom and his half-brothers show up. Verse 47. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, 
Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, don't think that Jesus is blowing off his earthly family here. He's actually revealing who his eternal family is. It's those who do, he says, the will of my Father in heaven. In other words, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever places their faith and trust in Him alone as Lord and Savior, you become part of the the family of God, the eternal part of God's kingdom, the eternal part of His family. We will dwell together with Him forever. And that's what Jesus says over and over again in the Gospel of John, whoever believes in me will live forever. Whoever comes to me, I'll by no means cast out. You know, John 3.16, we know that verse very well. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we know that Jesus loved His mother very much. Even as He's dying on the cross, we read in, um, I think it's John 19, it's not on the screen, but He's on the cross and He's telling, you know, John, the apostle, here's your mother, pointing to Mary. Take care of her when I'm dead and gone and raise up. And then he tells his mother, here's your son, speaking of you know, the Apostle John, that you know, they were going to take care of each other. And John did after Jesus went back home to heaven. We also know that his brothers get saved after the resurrection of Christ. We're told that when he rises up in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 7, it says that he appeared to James, speaking of his ha- ha- half-brother James here. James would become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And then we're also told that Mary and his brother, brothers, uh, just before the Pentecost, they were part of the 120 that were gathered together, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And so he's not blowing off his family, but he's saying, this is my real family, those who do the will of God, those who will receive me as Lord and Savior. In some amazing way, <laughs> All of us in here, we're family. And, uh, you know, what's that old saying? Um, You can choose your friends, but you're stuck with your relatives. (laughs) We're stuck with each other, and that's a good thing. We'll spend eternity together. It's going to be awesome for eons being up there, hearing everybody's salvation testimony, hearing, you know, how the Lord got a hold of people's lives and all the things He did in our lives. It's going to be an awesome time that we have to spend with the Lord. So look at chapter 13, verse 1. It says, On the same day, Jesus went out of the house. So he's in this house, and he's talking to the multitudes. He leaves the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So Jesus walks out of the house, and just in a couple minutes, he's there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. I mean, Capernaum's right there on the Sea of Galilee. So he just walks out of the house. He goes there, and he probably gets one of the disciples' boats. They probably push off like 25, 30 feet, and the crowds are standing there, you know, on the seashore, and he sits down in the boat. Maybe we should try that. I'll sit down. You guys stand up, and then when everybody starts dropping, then I'll know it's time to stop. And uh, (laughs) so that's what he does, And and he starts sharing them, and we'll see here in a moment, he'll talk to them in parables. Um... The Greek word for parables is pare or paraboles. It means to cast something alongside of something else. As we'll see, when Jesus spoke in parables, he was casting an earthly story alongside of a heavenly truth. And as a result, it's for the purpose of giving or illustrating a spiritual truth. For those who were hungering for the Lord, those who wanted to draw near to God, parables would open up their hearts and minds to receive the Lord and see more of what God was saying. But for the people who were hard hearted and they didn't want to hear God's truth, they were just following Jesus because they were getting a free meal, you know, or a healing or whatever it might have been. Those who were following him for the wrong motives, these parables would keep them in spiritual darkness. As we'll also see, as Jesus taught in parables, he always used places and, you know, things that were very familiar to the people in Israel. This first parable that we're going to look at, it's also the most important one because it lays the foundation for everything else he'll share in parables. So look at verse 3. 
he gets in the boat, he's off the, you know, shore, the, shore, you know, whatever, 20 feet, 30 feet. And then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went up to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth or soil, and they immediately sprang up and be, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then he says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, again, all these Jewish people, they would have known exactly what he was talking about when he's bringing these things to light here. He's, you know, it's an agricultural area. But, you know, Israel, that's what they were known for, you know, planting and sowing and reaping and all these things. They understood what he was saying in the natural realm. The wayside, he says, that was a hard packed soil that, you know, that you'd walk around the fields and as you walked around, I mean, it's like any path, they get packed down with animals, with people, and it becomes like a sidewalk. It's, it's very hard. So when the sower, he's throwing the seeds out there, it hits the wayside, it just stays on the surface. And the birds come and swoops it right up, he says. Easy pickings for the birds. The stony ground, it didn't have much uh, depth in soil. It was very shallow, and so it would wither and quickly die. Obviously, the soil with the thorns or weeds, as the plant came up, then these weeds would start choking it off. But the good ground would be able to produce a lot of wheat. But notice that Jesus says in verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you have an ear for the things of God, if you want to know who God is like, what God is like, if you want to know His plans for your life, then a parable can reveal those things to you. But if you don't want to know God, if you don't care about the things of God, then you're going to stay in the dark. A parable will conceal His plans that He has for you. Now, Jesus will explain this parable in just a moment. So first of all, He says this in verse 10, or it says, And the disciples came and said to Him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand." And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. And here Jesus quotes from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. First of all, notice Jesus says, It's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So the word for mysteries means something that was previously hidden has now been made known. A previously unknown truth has now been revealed. Only those who have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying can understand this mystery. Now, it's amazing how many people can hear the Word of God, but they don't really know what God is saying. I was like that for many years. I was in the Bible quite a bit when I was in a cult, and they had another book they'd put alongside of the Bible that would try to tell you what the Bible was saying, but it made absolutely no sense. I mean, I could read through, and I did, went through the New Testament as an unbeliever, had no idea who Jesus was, had no idea who God was, had no idea why Jesus came from heaven to earth. It made no sense because my heart was very hard. Now, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is speaking about here is that whoever will believe in Him, whoever will receive Him as their Lord and Savior, they will become members of the kingdom of God. In verse 12, notice Jesus says, For whoever has has what? Well, ears to hear, 
To him, more will be given. In other words, once you receive the truth of God's word and you believe in Christ, you receive him into your life, the more the Bible is going to make sense. Before you are born again, you can read through the Bible. I, I use my best friend out in San Diego. His dad was um, started a law school out there, a very brilliant man. He would read through the Bible three times from Genesis to Revelation, and he didn't know the Lord. He could tell you a lot of things about it. It wasn't until well, a couple of years before he died. He was in his late 80s when he finally received the Lord. My best friend was able to lead him to Christ. Amazing. But as you open up your heart to the Lord, you receive the Lord, then the Word of God begins to come alive within your heart because God's Word is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You'll have an abundance of wisdom, abundance of understanding concerning God's love for you and His promises to you and all that Jesus has done for you and all that the Holy Spirit wants to do in you once you're saved. Now here we see Jesus quoting from Isaiah 6. This was spoken to uh, by God to Isaiah. And this is right after God says, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, Here I am, send me. And then the very next thing God says is quoted here. God quotes these verses because he knew that most of the people in Isaiah's day would not listen to the word of God. They would not repent of their idolatry. They would not repent of their wickedness. They were going to do their own thing. They would refuse to turn their lives over to the Lord. Same thing's happening in Jesus' day. That's why he quotes this. Most of the people are here. They're following me for all the wrong reasons. We'll talk about that in a moment. But... It's because they're dull of hearing. They, they just want things that God is not wanting to give them. They want all this other stuff. Don't be discouraged when you share Jesus with people because so often the seed will fall on hard soil, as we'll see here in a moment. A few people will listen, but most people do not repent or turn to Christ. So look at verse 16. Jesus tells his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men, speaking about Old Testament saints, desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In other words, all these Old Testament saints, the prophets, these righteous people in the Old Testament, they longed to see the Messiah. They were hoping for the Messiah. They were longing to see their Savior show up. But how blessed Peter, James, John, the other you know, 12 were to see Jesus, to hear Him, to walk with Him for three and a half years. Peter records it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. This is what he says of this event. Of this salvation, 1 Peter 1.10, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of, here's the Old Testament guys, prophesying of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them, it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. And so again, Peter and all these other apostles, they knew how blessed they were that all that these Old Testament prophets were saying about the Messiah came true when Jesus came to earth. And they got to hang out with him. They got to see him. They got to be with him and hear everything he said and did. And so they had that personal relationship with the Lord. Look at verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Now, Jesus is going to explain to them what this parable is all about. It's in Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Check this verse out, because right after he quotes from Isaiah, this is what Mark says of this scene. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? 
In other words, if you understand this parable, then all the other parables will make a lot more sense. It'll be a lot easier to understand because this parable contains the main characters, the main, you know, the major players, the, all the components that we need to figure out the other parables. So this is why we're going to key in on this one. Verse 19, this is where he explains it. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one, Satan, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. And so right off the bat, we see the seed was sown. That's the word of God. And as we'll also see here, the four types of soil are the four types of a human heart, the four conditions of the human heart. This first one is the hard-packed dirt that Jesus, again, calls the wayside. It's been trampled down. It's been you know, walked on. It's had carts pulled over it. So it's like cement. It's like a sidewalk. You throw the seed out there, it's easy pickings for the bird. And here he says this, the word of God goes forth and the hard heart can't receive it. So the enemy comes, swoops in, takes all that truth of God's word right out of their hearts, right out of their life. A lot of people, including me, have had hearts that were by the wayside. And there can be a lot of different reasons for having hard hearts. Um, I love to use the example. When I was down in Bolivia a number of years ago, we were on a mission trip. I want this other church from San Diego, friends of mine. And we got to go to these public schools in La Paz. And it was just amazing because public schools were inviting Christians to come in and preach the gospel to their students. <laughs> I, was, I was like, what country are we in? You know, you can't do that in America. I couldn't go into Central or GJ or Palisades. I'm going to preach the gospel here. Oh, yeah, sure you will. I'll kick you out. They'll call the cops on you down there. So this one school, I loved it because the principal, she was born and raised in Cuba. Under Castro, I said, what do you think of Castro? Well, I got a good education. That's about all I can say about him. And then so she's in Bolivia. She's a principal there of this uh, high school. Born again Christian, and she goes, I want you guys to come in here and I want you to preach the gospel to the students, to the high school kids. And I was like, Oh, okay. So, this is the story I went with. This is, the Lord put it on my heart to go through the parable of the sower. And so, I was just going through these verses and I talked about the, the hard packed soil and why people's hearts are hard. And all these girls in the class started crying. And getting, you know, they're starting to tear up and some are just like, oh, you know, bawling. And I'm like talking to the translator, what's going on here? He goes, well, most all these girls, at least 50% of them have all been abused. They've all been misused. They've all been whatever, sexually abused and so forth. And so when you talk about why is, and I was talking about why are there hard hearts? Because you've been abused. You've been mistreated. You've had other people walk all over you. You've been involved or had people in your home that are just in drugs and alcohol and everything else. Maybe you were neglected. Maybe you were abandoned. And so at the end, I get through it all and I say, you know what? Your heart may be hard, but Jesus can soften your heart. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. And I get to a point where it's like, okay, who wants to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior? There's 40 kids in that particular classroom. They had like a you know, light bulb hanging there in the middle of the classroom. That's all they had. 39 hands go up. And I'm like, oh, wow, how come not 40? <laughs> well, he's already saved. I was talking to the translator. And I was like, oh, cool. And uh, so they, they all came to Christ. And, and every classroom was like that in this school. It was just amazing. But the, the reality of who Jesus is, the love that God had for them, that he could change their life from being hard-hearted, being beaten down, knowing that there's eternity with the Lord if you'll surrender to Him. It was awesome. So there can be a lot of reasons why people's hearts become hard, become callous towards the Word of God. Some people, you know, it's just pride. It's just arrogance. It's self-righteousness. Maybe they have an entitlement attitude. Oh, I don't need God. I'll just wait on the government to give me what I want. But whatever the reason, when the Word of God was preached to them and me for a lot of years, you know, the seeds fell on hard soil, the enemy comes, takes it right away, and you're no different than you were before. You're still miserable, you're still hopeless, you're still bitter. And I've told you guys before, I, I heard the gospel at least 25 times before I got saved. Very clear from people, most of the time it was guys on our baseball team at San Diego State, and they would share the 
true gospel with me. And I would cuss them out. <laughs> I'd say, get out of my face. I don't want to hear this stuff. You know, and I rejected the Lord so often. I was a jerk to those Christians. Now, as a Christian, we shouldn't be jerks to those who have hard hearts. They weren't jerks to me. You know, they love me. They prayed for me. That's what we need to do with people who have hard hearts. Pray for them. Be patient with them. Keep, you know, telling them about Jesus because eventually something will rock their little world like God did in my life. And God will use that to get your attention, get their attention. And oftentimes it's at that moment when our hearts become prepared to receive the gospel for me the 26th time. And I opened up my heart to receive Christ. So sometimes it takes a while. So don't give up on hard-hearted people. God still loves them. Well, look at verse 20. Here's the next type of soil. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while, for when, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So this is the second type of soil. Jesus refers to it as the stony, rocky, shallow soil. There are many places in Israel when you're just walking around there, the soil might look really good. The top soil looks great, but you dig down like an inch or two, and it's just solid bedrock. And so that's the type of soil he's talking about. You throw seeds on that, the, the, the Israelites, they knew, yeah, you can throw a seed on there, it'll pop up, but it'll quickly wither and die because the sun will get hot. There's no root system. It'll just quickly dry up and die. So this is like a lot of people who make an emotional decision about Jesus, or they hear a very shallow message from a pastor who says things like, come to Jesus and he'll make your life happy. Come to Jesus, and He'll make you healthy and wealthy. Come to Jesus, and all your problems will go away. That's not the gospel. That's not a gospel. That's not what the gospel is. A lot of people will make that emotional decision. They say, this is great. All my problems are gone. My business is booming. I've never felt better. But here Jesus says, this kind of person only endures for a while. Notice He says, for when, not if, tribulations come, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And again, the word stumbles there is the Greek word scandalon, which was the bait stick. They would use that to trap the animals. And so Jesus is saying, this is what sets off the trap. <clears throat> oh, everything is great and wonderful. I love being around all these Christian people. We sing happy songs. We you know, pat everybody in the back. This is wonderful. But when a trial comes... When the doctor says cancer, when the boss fires you, or a million other things that can happen and probably will, because there's no depth in your relationship with Jesus Christ, because you've believed wrong things about Jesus, because your relationship with Jesus was based on nothing but superficial, emotionally driven programs of false teachers, a lot of make-believers, and this is what I think it's referring to, the make-believers will turn away from following Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus said would happen. You go through the Gospel of John, and you get to chapter 6, and it's right after he feeds the multitudes, 5,000 people with a little boy's Lunchable. You know, he's got a little Lunchable in his you know, backpack, and like, yeah, Andrew brings him to, hey, I found this kid. He's got a couple little fish and some little pieces of bread. Jesus multiplies it, multiplies it. It says 5,000 men, that means plus their wives, plus their kids. 15, 20,000 people get fed with this little boy's lunch. And it says they were all filled. And then they followed Jesus when he crosses over the Sea of Galilee. They all come to him and Jesus says, you know why you're following me? Because I fed you with that boy's lunch. I gave you food. That's why you're following me. That's not a good reason why to follow him. So he goes on to challenge them in John 6. He says uh, things like, I'm the bread of life. He who believes in me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And then he goes a step further. I, you, unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no life in you. Now, he's not talking about his literal body and blood, as the Catholic Church says. That's not what he's talking about, because he says, the things I say to you, these are spiritual things. 
He's not saying like, here, take my thumb, eat it, and then you'll have life. That's ridiculous. But he, he was very clear. It meant they needed to follow him, trust him alone for salvation. So you get further into John chapter 6, and many disciples are leaving him. And in verse 66, it says this, because he's saying hard things to him. He wasn't just going to fill their bellies up anymore. So he says from that, or it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and followed him no more. Why? Because they're shallow. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, and it literally means emphatically, you alone have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's really the bottom line when it comes to following Jesus. Yes, His blessings are great. His blessings are wonderful. But the main reason we follow Jesus is because He's the only one that can save us. He's the only one that can wash our sins away. He's the only one that died on the cross and shed His blood so that we can be cleansed and forgiven. He's the only way to heaven. And I know He loves me because He alone went to the cross and took upon Himself all the punishment and pain that I deserve for my sins. He took it upon Himself when He shed His blood as the only acceptable price for sin. And if anybody comes to Jesus for any other reason than that, because He's going to make me happy. He's going to make me wealthy. You're in shallow soil. Because when trials come, and they will, you're going to quickly fall away. When hardships come, and they will, they quickly fall back into the ways of the world and the flesh. Look at the third type of soil, verse 22. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Both the shallow soil and this, I'll call it weedy soil, are probably the most common types of hearts that we find in churches in America today. This third soil represents the crowded heart, the, the worldly heart. It illustrates the person who does not repent of their fleshly, carnal ways. They do not weed out the things in their life that keeps them from getting close to Christ. It keeps them from producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. It's not shallow. It's, the soil's deep enough. The roots will go down. But guess what? As soon as the plant comes up, it can't grow up and out because there's so many weeds that are choking it out. It's choked out, he says, by the cares, the riches, the pleasures of this world. There are a lot of people in churches like this today. They hear the Word, but they think about the Word of God for a while, and they decide that their worldly pursuits are more important than pursuing a close, intimate relationship with Christ. We see it all the time. This is basically what idolatry is all about. People start putting other things other pleasures, and other people above Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. They are pursuing riches and pleasures and things of the world. They're not saying, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. They're not saying, Lord, I deny myself. I take up my cross, die to my fleshly desires and follow you. They just start doing whatever they want to do. And they take Jesus. Hey, let me put Jesus in my pocket. I'll pull him out when I need him. But most of the time, I don't need him. I got what I got. I got what I need. This phrase here, the cares of the world, it's the Greek word mer merimna, merimna, and it means to be pulled in many different directions. The cares of the world. Don't you? you and we all feel that way at times. Don't I, I feel like I'm being pulled in a thousand different directions. All right, we've all said that. We've all been there. And sometimes we are being pulled in all these different directions. But the Lord says, no, no, keep your focus on me. Keep coming back to me. Don't let these things pull your heart away from me. Just keep focusing on me. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. 
And all these other things will be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. This is what Jesus said, or Paul says about this. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, in other words, you're born again, you follow Jesus, you're a new creation in Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. With the shallow soil, people put their reputation before Jesus, but with the weedy soil, people put worldly stuff before Jesus. This all boils down to, where is your hope? Well, I hope I win the lottery. <laughs> That's pretty shallow. That's pretty worldly. And more than likely, you'll get struck by lightning before that happens. I had a guy say, hey, Jeff, don't worry. I'm going to pay off the church someday. And it's like, really? How are you going to do that? I'm going to win the lottery. And he's always buying lottery tickets. And it's like, okay, you, whatever. Lord, may you please bless. No, <laughs> I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> He moved away. He never won. Oh, well. You know, do we put our hope in these things? Well, then I'll be happy if I get all this stuff. Do we put our hope that the world is going to get better? Oh, if we just pass a new green deal, then oh, the world will be nice and clean. And No, that's ridiculous. The Bible says Jesus is our living hope. The Apostle Paul says Jesus is our blessed hope. We're looking for Him to come back for His bride. That's a blessed hope indeed. In Hebrews it says that Jesus is the, the uh, He is called the, our, the anchor of our soul. That hope in Him is the anchor of our soul. It's sure, it's foundational, it's steadfast. He doesn't waver because Jesus is the rock upon which we build our lives. And so we need to be very careful that we don't allow the world to pull us in a thousand different directions. That will choke out, that will strangle the Word of God in our lives. Notice Jesus says the same thing about the deceitfulness of riches. How are riches deceitful? Well, we think they're going to make us happy and healthy. We think if we just have enough money, we will be safe and secure. Riches become deceitful when we think we can substitute our dependency on Jesus for worldly wealth. I should have looked it up again because I forgot how it all went. Remember this past week, that rich lady in Beverly Hills, very philanthropic lady, thought she was safe and secure, lived in a beautiful mansion in Beverly Hills, and some guy broke into her house and killed her. Rob, so they caught the guy, which is good. But she thought she was safe and secure. You know, you got all this money, you got all this protection, you got all the alarm system. doesn't take long to lose it all. Now, on the other hand, the Bible is clear that wealth and prosper prosperity are not sinful things. Many people in the Bible were extremely wealthy. Abraham was wealthy. Isaac, Jacob, they're all wealthy. King David was very wealthy. King Solomon, more than we could imagine. The problem is, and this is what Solomon found out, is when wealth takes precedence over the Lord. I can't remember who said it originally, but it's, uh, basically it says, um, money is a great servant, but it makes a horrible master. If it's your master, you're in trouble. If it's a, you, know, you have control over that, it's a blessing for sure. Here's how the Apostle Paul says it. Um, Many of you ladies who went through the women's Bible study here last month, you know this, 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, it's not money, but it's the love of it, that lust for it, is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. And so that's getting caught up, the weeds, the thorns choking out and causing them many sorrows. A few verses later in 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul says, and I've always said, this is for all of us. Command those who are rich in this present age. That's every American. Compared to the rest of the world, and I've been in a lot of places where they don't have anything. I love going up to Northeast India. They don't have anything. I mean, they might make 
$20 a month, but they're content. The Christians are happy. They're, they're living day to day. But here he's commanding all of us, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or puffed up, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So again, the bottom line is, however the Lord blesses us, be a good steward over what He's entrusted to you. And then He'll just keep giving more so you can be a better steward. It's just being a conduit for Him to flow into and flow out of. So look for those ways to build up the body of Christ and also look for ways to build up the kingdom of God. In these first three types of soil, we see that people's hearts are under attack from Satan, from the flesh, from the world. That sound familiar? That's how Jesus was tempted. That's how Eve was tempted in the garden. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Satan comes, the world, the flesh, and the devil attack. So look at the, third, uh, the fourth type of soil, verse 23. We'll close with this. But he who receives seed... On the good ground, take note of that word good, is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. The word for good here is the Greek word kalos, K-A-L-O-S, and most of the time it's translated beautiful. That's interesting. This is Jesus talking about our hearts. In other words... He's saying it's a beautiful thing in my eyes when I see that my word is finding good soil because I know the Holy Spirit's going to plant those seeds deep in your heart and it's going to produce good fruit, an abundance of fruit. We're hearing God's word. We're understanding what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. That's a good thing in the eyes of Jesus. That's only possible when a person's heart has been converted you know, this cannot happen in an unconverted heart. This refers to all born-again Christians. And so if you have asked Jesus into your heart, then that's proof that the Lord has found beautiful soil and is good soil because, again, the Holy Spirit, He's the one that softens our hearts. It's like Jesus is the master gardener. Even as Christians, we can get a hard heart, Oh, that jerk just cut me off on the road. I want to run him off. I want to chase him down. I'm going to give him what for. And so it's like, okay, Lord, you're the master gardener. You need to rototill that part of my heart. Soften it up. Let the rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit, soften it up. And he'll produce good fruit, more fruit. As we yield our lives over to Jesus, he produces, it says, sometimes it's a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. What kind of fruit is he wanting to produce in your life? It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Very simple. Let's close with these verses. Galatians 5, starting in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. This is what Jesus is wanting to produce in the good, beautiful soil of our lives. And we're the only ones that get in the way of it. But he says the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's agape. Joy, peace, long-suffering or patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Well, eight out of nine is not bad, but I don't have any self-control. Well, let him dig up that part of your life, your heart. Against such, there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so again, it's coming to the end of ourselves saying, Lord, you need to do this work. You know, my heart's not right. I give it back to you because I keep trying to take stuff on myself. I just turn it over to you, and he, you know, works the soil. He plants the seed. He waters it. He brings the increase. It's only as this fruit is being produced in our lives that the world around us can taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. This is when it makes sense to those around us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. That's what the world needs to taste and see. The love of God, the peace, the joy that we have. They, they taste and see that as we're walking in the Spirit, putting off the deeds of the flesh. Remember what Jesus says there in John 13? 
This is how the world's going to know you're my disciple, by the agape, the love you have for one another. When that's being produced, when the Holy Spirit's working in us, working through us, then others can see that God is good, that He is alive, that Jesus is working in us and He's working through us. And we share the good, you know, the seed, the gospel to those who need to hear it. Very simple. We can't save anybody, but Jesus can. All he wants us to be is, you know, toss the seed out there wherever we go and let him do the work. And then he gets all the glory because he chooses the foolish to confound the wise. Here I am. He chooses the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty, the abased things to put to shame the noble. And so he chooses us, he uses us. That way he gets all the glory. You guys.